Two weeks ago, we looked at what might be thought of as the default American religion, which is sort of an altruistic hedonism. You are your current emotional state. And what you're trying to do is string together as much of that state as you can. And the way to do that is to situate yourself with things that make you happy. People, beauty, pleasure, you name it. If you could so sort of control your environment and control the people around you and get everyone to do as you want them to do, then you can have a happy life. And the degree to which you can sort of extend this as long as possible without hopefully anything difficult like ill health or broken legs or anything like that, then you win the American game. The irony, of course, of that show, Selling Sunshine, where it seems that people are winning the game better than almost anyone else. They're more beautiful, they're more wealthy, they eat at the best restaurants, they have the best looking lovers, they have everything that America seems to offer, is that the show is about bickering and backbiting and reputational savaging. And most of the people can't seem to manage a marriage that lasts more than a few years. The show has a spirit, and that spirit is vicious. And that vicious spirit of reputation savaging is why people watch it for the dramatic spectacle. This week in some of the videos, Grim Grizz, who's the guy there in the middle, um, he asked the question, what does it take to move a man? Or what does it take to move someone? And this week, with all the drama that's sort of unfolding on our TV screens, or on our computer screens, war in Gaza, one thing sort of pushes out another. And Grim Grizz was asking, basically, what so many ask, which is, how can there be not only a permanent peace in the world, as in a secession of bloodshed, but a permanent peace in my life? What would it take for me to change and for that change to be permanent? Last week we talked about practices and a lot of people said, well, if I can get all of my practices underway, well then maybe I can do that. So for Selling Sunset, it's all about if I can get my surroundings underway, then maybe my insides will be better. With practices, it's more like, well, if I can sort of discipline my insides with routine and ritual and practices, maybe then the transformation will hold. Now, Paul, in this third chapter of the book of Colossians, lays down some things which seem very counterintuitive to us. He begins this way. Since then you have been raised with Christ. And when we hear that, we hear the past tense, and we wonder, what does that mean? I don't feel like I've been raised with Christ. My body's getting old. I wonder if the DMV will renew my license. I've got problems with my eyesight, problems with my heart, problems with my legs. I'm expecting a resurrection where I'll have a renewed body in a new heaven and a new earth. Why on earth would the Apostle Paul say, since you have been raised, past tense, with Christ? Paul talks about this way all the time. He says of Christians that a transformation has begun in us. It has been sealed in us by our baptism. Our baptism has united us in Christ's death and raised us in Christ's resurrection, and he's going to even, in fact, move us higher. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, your heart, in biblical language, is the center of yourself. All kinds of things go on during the day. You're distracted with You've got to make breakfast. You've got to take care of the dog. You've got a mother who's, who's in need of your help. You've got children who, are, who, who need attention and are struggling. And Paul says, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. 
What does that mean? And it also means in some way set your attention there. Jesus says, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. This is in some ways where you're to take this focus of your consciousness and set it there because Paul says, what has happened for you in Christ has already located you there. Now this is a difficult way of thinking. It's not very concrete. But bear with me because Paul's going to continue on with this. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And you think, well, I have to set my mind on earthly things. There are meals that need to be made, bills that need to be paid, things that need to happen, things that need to be done. And Paul isn't saying don't do those things. He is saying the center of your consciousness, of your life, of how you see yourself, should be with Christ in heaven. Hmm. For you died, and your life is now hidden with God in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, this sort of locates heaven as a spiritual source, an ideal, and our head. Now, if we look at selling sunset, we have a sense of, well, what is their life? Well, it's looking good. It's having money. It's having clothes. It's having cars. It's having beautiful houses to live in. It's having, having, having. And it's being this way. And it's having all of your friends applaud you. And that's not what Paul is talking about. Because their lives are pointing at something. They have an ideal that they are trying to hit. And their ideal is connected to American ideals. And they are reaching for that. And all of the struggle and drama is all of their struggle to attain that. The question is, what is your goal? What is and where is your life? Now, Paul says in Romans 6, you died with Christ. So something when Christ dies on the cross, what died in the minds of his disciples was, Jesus is going to kick out the Romans. Jesus is going to set up a throne in Jerusalem. Jesus is going to, they had all of these ideas. And on the cross, they all died. But something new came alive in the resurrection and in the ascension. And Paul says, this is where your life now should be. You died to the world. You were united with Christ in his crucifixion. Now follow him through the story. Paul says, your life is hidden in Christ. How many of you remember this dress? Okay, this was an internet sensation a few years ago. And I, for the life of me, have only seen it as one color. But apparently, and maybe this picture isn't a great one, there's, this dress was getting passed around Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and on the news because apparently when people see it, some people see it as one color and some people see it as another color. Perception is a very strange thing. And... Basically, what Paul is saying is that everybody looks at you one way, but because of Christ's work, there's a new reality which is true of you. Your new life is hidden, and people can't see it. Some people might know it, and I hear this when I do funerals. It's not unusual to do a funeral, or maybe a birthday party, but often at funerals, Someone who has just sort of seemed to live a normal life, nobody's paying attention, and then you get these eulogy virtues. Someone comes up and says, I was down on my luck. I didn't have any help. And this person went out of their way to help me, and nobody knew about it. Now again, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, you might understand why nobody knew about it, because the Sermon on the Mount says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When you help out someone, 
Do it quietly. And so what this means is that there are saints amongst us who are doing things quietly. And when you walk in the church, just look around and say, oh, it's sort of got normal people in it. But your life is hidden. You are working on something that the world does not see. Now, selling Sunset, everyone in the world sees it. And in fact, they want everyone in the world to see it because they want to be celebrated by the world. But your life in Christ is hidden. It's quiet. Nobody knows about it. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, again, I often hear people say, this in this case, usually with tragedy, maybe someone loses a child. And it's not at all unusual to hear that mother say, that child was my life. Or someone loses a beloved spouse. It's not at all unusual to hear the bereaved spouse to say, he was my life. That's not unusual for us. We know that in some ways we place our lives in other things and we locate our lives in things. Maybe you locate your life in your reputation. Maybe you locate your life in always looking a certain way. Maybe you locate your life in, in having certain things. And Paul says, when Christ who is your life appears, everything will look differently. And I'm reading a book which has a strange word called profilicity. And this particular author says, in the age of sincerity, your reputation and status were dependent on dutifully fulfilling the identity and role you inherited, maybe as a mother, maybe as a farmer, maybe as a father. These roles were inherited and you gained status and reputation by doing them faithfully. In the modern period, we have this sense of authenticity. People leave their homes to find themselves. Everyone from the old age would say, you only find yourself at home because your life is at home amidst the people you grew up with. The age of authenticity, people go out to discover themselves, which they believe is somewhere their true self. Well, now people's age are on, people's identities are on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or someplace where they are seen and known out there in the public. Jesus says, your life is in Christ, and you will be revealed when he comes in glory. I used this illustration on a sermon oh, a few months ago. C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis is traveling through heaven, and there's a parade, and there's a glorious woman. And, and Lewis thinks, well, 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 in some ways, Lewis is taking a page from Dante. And Lewis's guide says, on earth, you would never have given this woman a second thought. Lewis even gives her the plainest name you can imagine in England, Sarah Smith. Sarah Smith lives in a house that nobody paid any attention to in a neighborhood that was not necessarily desirable. But now suddenly when Christ appears, she's surrounded by an entourage. There are animals, there are angels, there are people beyond number celebrating her. Why? Well, every young man or boy that met her became her son even if it was only the boy that brought the meat to her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. And Lewis says, oh, that doesn't sound very good. But he's corrected. Those on whom her love fell went back to their natural parents, loving them even more. Few men looked on her without becoming, in a certain fashion, her lovers but was the kind of love that made them not less true, but truer to their own wives. I don't think you find Sarah Smith on Selling Sunset. 
It's not the kind of attraction that's going on. Set your minds on things above. Realize that what looks good now will not always look good. You've seen that. Many of you who have lived a number of decades know that. The stuff you focused on 40 years ago, things grab our attention. And Paul says, set your mind on Christ. Let all those things work their own way out. Adopt a perspective of heaven looking at blind, rebellious earth and rework your priorities to align with the coming kingdom of the resurrected Christ. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices, and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and all. Paul is in a sense saying, well, if you look at Selling Sunset, what you find in Selling Sunset is as old as anything else. You can dress it up, you can put jewelry on it, you can put it in great cars, you can put it in beautiful homes, but you know what? It's the same old, same old. And that's been pervasive, no matter how you dressed it up, from time immemorial. Now, there's another way. And unlike Selling Sunset, that has the most exclusive neighborhood and the best genetics and the sharpest looking and all of the stuff that people try to reach, there is no barrier to a better life. And then he lists all of these things that were barriers. Oh, Jews and Gentiles, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, those were uncultured people who didn't know the fine way of living, which was the Roman way. Scythians, Scythians were sort of like terrorists. They were a group of people on the Roman frontier that the Romans just couldn't conquer. Slave or free, people who were owned by others, people who were free to do as they pleased. But Christ is all in all. In other words, there is no barrier to this new life. There are lots of barriers to being in the entourage of the emperor. There are lots of barriers into being a star in Hollywood. There are lots of barriers to being a beauty queen. There are lots of barriers to all the things that the world seeks after. But the truly good things, there's no barrier at all. Do you have bad health? That's not a barrier. Do you have little money? That's not a barrier. There are no barriers to what Jesus is about to give. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. The irony, of course, is you watch Selling Sunset, you know what they're doing? They're nurturing their little grievances. They're waiting for this other woman to show up and have a faux pas or have a stumble in her reputation, and then they'll pounce. Not in Christ. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Paul says these are like clothing. Put them on. 
Wear them. Make them your life. You don't need money to do this. You don't need beauty to do this. You don't need fame to do this. In fact, money, beauty, and fame, they can all get in the way. It's easier to do this if, in fact, you live a quiet, common life. Last week, I entitled last week's sermon, Why Does the Bible Tell People to Stop Doing Religious Things? And we talked about practices. Your practices are going to vary by time and culture. They always do. They'll be understood in different ways. And they can always come with the risk of self-righteousness. But this list that Paul gives, even genocidal dictators want this of their underlings. It's an amazing list. Everybody wants this for their children. They might not want it for themselves, but they want it for their neighbors, and they want it for the others around them. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You want something practical? Here it is in the list. Treat people this way. Be this way. It requires no money. Now, Someone might say, it's difficult. Yes. And this book that I've mentioned a number of times in this illustration that I've used before, Langdon Gilkey in this Japanese internment camp in China watched people under stress. Not enough food. They were confined to difficult circumstances. And he, as a young man who, well, he, at least he could find a girl, that he could have some fun with. But he watched these families and these missionaries and these business people and these diplomats in turn, and he made a study of them because he wondered, for all of the pretense that they have in the world, when you take away their luxuries, what is left? And somewhere, it was a little, in some ways, it was a little contained experiment like in the book of Job. And there he found Eric Little. This guy who had fame by being a sprinter in England and winning the gold in the Olympics. But what Langdon Gilkey discovered was he was a saint. And when the young people out of boredom were sort of playing around with sex in illicit corners, and the missionaries and parents got together and said, these young people need better ways to spend their time, as often as not, Eric would be bent over a chessboard or a model boat or directing some sort of square dance, absorbed, warm, and interested, pouring all of himself into this effort to capture the minds and imaginations of those pent-up youths. Not something big and dramatic, something small, something real, something personal and his quality was shown. He died in the camp. But the story lives on. You might say, now pastor, this doesn't come naturally to me. You know what comes naturally? Hitting back, complaining. What comes naturally to me is doing all the kinds of things that everyone else does and chasing up status ladders. Yes, me too. That's what comes naturally to us. Hence, you were united with Christ in his death. You were raised with him in his resurrection. Your life is seated with him in heaven. And Paul says, this is all true of you now. Live out this truth. Remember, you are not saved by your performance. Now, your performance can save you from some things. But it's not the final thing. You are not saved by your performance. All of this comes from gratitude, which is why Paul says, keep your focus on Christ 
and let the gratitude move you. And let the clicker move the slide. There we go. Since you have been raised with Christ, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. How you are seen in this world will change dramatically. All those eulogy virtues will suddenly become obvious to everyone. Put to death those things that are keeping you down. For these, the wrath of God comes. There is no barrier to any of this, Jew or Greek, circumcised or not, whether you be uncultured, whether you be seen as someone who is against the dominant way of the world, whether you have no options in life or every option in life, Christ is available to you. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Look at this list. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone else, do you have a grievance? Bury it. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Lord, we are bad at this. We are so easily moved to chase what everyone else is chasing. Our desires are borrowed from one another. And you ask us to place our eyes on you. And the things that you ask us to embody, no one in this world has an argument with. Everyone wants their neighbor to be humble and kind and compassionate and generous. But Lord, for us ourselves, we're going to work grievance and avarice in order to try to get what we want. Forgive us in the ways that we have not yet lived out the life of Christ. Help us, Lord, to see him as our life. And may we, Lord, follow him so that one day, like Sarah Smith or Eric Little, your glory might be seen through us. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs>